Are we good? We can start recording. Okay. All right. Welcome and welcome to you who are watching either the live stream or later catching the video. Uh, we are here in our First Presbyterian Church of Starkville Fellowship Hall, and this is where we'll be for the next month with uh, Wednesday night studies as well as uh, Sunday morning worship for several weeks as refurbishing and renovation is going on or will be going on in a few beginning a few days from now up in our regular sanctuary. So I can tell you that uh, we will meet next week. Reed is going to do a study next week on July the 5th and then I'll pick back up studies uh, on the other side the second half of July. So our youth are going to meet next week and then they're off for a couple, a week or two. And then the second half of July, we'll do Wednesday night studies, most likely here in the fellowship hall, uh, that I'll teach again uh, the last couple Wednesdays of July, and then probably heading into August. I will tell you, um, one, am, am I, is it every, everything good, Reed? I'm on? Good. Uh, I, I'll tell you one thing that I'm thinking about doing a study on, uh, just because Keith Koning asked me about uh, passage from 1 Peter 3.19, etc., um, about Jesus going and preaching to the spirits in prison, and he read the commentary in the table talk from Ligonier and said, after reading this, I'm wondering about why we say descended into hell, and uh, he, he wants me to kind of dig into that for him. I went ahead and told him, Actually, I don't totally agree with what's in the commentary at the close of the table talk. I like table talk a lot, but um, the way the article opens up is pretty flat. Um, no discussion of the whole counsel of God. So if Keith wants me to look at Descended into Hell, I'm thinking I should do it for all of us. So we may look at two or three key phrases of controversy or that I typically get questions on in the Apostles' Creed and maybe do that. Would y'all be interested in that? Um, you know, um, the Holy Catholic Church descended into hell, those types of things. I may look at some of those and we'll do a few Bible studies on those. Uh, does that sound good? If Keith wants me to look at this, I don't want to just do it for Keith. Maybe we do it for everybody. So, all right. Now, um, and so, Keith, thank you for the inspiration. If you're watching online or catching this video later, we'll uh, share it with everybody. Now, tonight, we are on the third in three uh, studies on friendship that we've been doing this month as our Wednesday night study under the title, No Greater Love. And I have good news for you. And if you're watching, if you've been following these online, we are actually going to arrive tonight at where the title comes from from the, the lips of Jesus, from the words of Jesus, no greater love, understanding friendship. Now, I brought today uh, this book that is in, uh, that we use with children's ministry, and it says, Friend Who Forgives. Who is our friend who forgives us? Jesus. And then we're called to forgive one another if we're really friends with Jesus and to be gracious to one another even when... Um, you know, others sin against us or sin ultimately against God in a way that harms us. So anyway, this is Jesus who is graciously forgiving of his friends. And that then leads into our discussion tonight. No greater love following Jesus in true friendship. Now, I'm going to recap some of the things we've covered. And I'm going to try to do that pretty promptly because we've missed a few minutes of our study tonight. Uh, we may go a few minutes over tonight just because we're a little late in starting, but um, let me go over some of the things. Now, I'm going to go ahead and give you, to make sure I get it in front of you, the actual verse, the gospel according to John 15, 13. Those of you who are Bible folks, you probably already knew that's where this verse was coming from. Uh, the gospel of John chapter 15, verse 13. That, that's the prompter for the title for this series. As you know, the other prompter for this series has simply been that since our youth this summer are studying friendship and real biblically guided friendship, you know, at their level, middle school level, junior high level, and high school level, different conversations with the different age groups, I thought, well, it would be good if we do this for adult study. 
And for those of you who have children or grandchildren in our youth program, and for that matter, matter, children or grandchildren anyway, but definitely who are coming to our youth program, you are tasked with, and I'm equipping you to do a good job of this, of talking with your teenagers or talking with your preteens about what friendship is and how Jesus guides us in friendship, right? You are going to be well-versed. Uh, you already are, actually, at the first two sessions we've had on this and now to the third. But here it is. Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. That's John chapter 15, verse 13. We'll come back to that. That is the bar. That's the standard that Jesus gives us. Uh, as we've been, uh, I'll just repeat again a couple proverbs that I've included and highlighted every time we've started this three-part series. A friend loves at all times. A true friend loves at all times. Not just when you're useful to him or her. Not just when you seem to be popular with the other kids. A friend loves at all times. Um, and a brother is born for adversity. Not just, well, maybe he will come through or she will come through. A brother, a true friend who's like a brother to you, is going to have your back in times of adversity. That's what Proverbs chapter 17, 17 says. And then, of course, we've also looked at Proverbs 18, 24. I've repeated it all three times. Uh, a man of many companions may come to ruin. You got a bunch of so-called friends that, that may not do it for you when you're in trouble. They may all turn on you, you know, different little groups, you know, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother, and that is a friend who truly, who truly is your friend no matter what. And ultimately, of course, this verse is realized and fulfilled in Jesus. Okay, all right, so let's go back a few, a few notes on what we're talking about, the love languages, or the love words of the Greek, of Greek language and certainly the Koine Greek of the New Testament. A couple of highlighted words or, or ranges of words that we've talked about. Philia, which means friendship love. So you know this. I mentioned this, I think, both times previously. You know more Greek than you think you do. Philadelphia, what does that mean? Brotherly love, right? Okay. So we say that Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. And by the way, remember that at the time of Jesus, there was a Decapolis city that you know as Amman, Jordan. Okay. In David's time, it was called Rabbah, Amman the high city of the Ammonites. It's where Uriah the Hittite, remember him? That's where he dies, at Rabbah Amman. Okay? In the Greco-Roman period, in the Roman Empire period, and, and the Greek, the Hellenistic period prior to that, that city was kind of taken over and modernized, and you might call it westernized. And during the time of Jesus, that city there that we know as Amman, Jordan, had a different name. And what was that name? Philadelphia, right? The city of brotherly love, Delphus and Philia. Philia means friendship, love, uh, and then you, you combine it. Really, a lot of what this scripture is talking about is that combination of fr a friend who's actually even better to you than a blood brother and a true brotherly friendship, okay? So as um, we saw C.S. Lewis says in The Four Loves, it, Philia, is a higher level love because it is freely chosen. Do you see that? You don't choose your siblings. You know, you're supposed to, you're supposed to love them, and you may love them, but you may get irritated with them, this, that, and the other thing, or y'all may, you know, when mom or daddy dies, I can, I can tell you this, y'all probably have too. I've seen countless families blow up over this, this son wanted this, and this son wants that from the estate, and this sister is mad at that brother-in-law. You know this, right? supposedly families are tight until you see uh, financial implications or future implications on the line. And they, the, the teeth can come out and the knives can come out, you know. But this is, the biblical model is true brotherly friendship, okay? So it is a higher level of love because it is freely chosen. To the ancients, 
Lewis says, friendship seemed the happiest and most fully human of all loves, even more than eros, even more than romantic love. The crown of life in the school of virtue. In the modern world, though, by comparison, ignores philia, true philia, true brotherly love. That's what Lewis said, um, you know, 60 years ago, 70 years ago. And uh, then from Francis Bacon's essay of friendship, for crowd is not company. I can go to a Mississippi State ball game and be around, you know, 65,000 of my so-called closest friends who are all ringing their cowbells. Uh, but when, you know, when the chips are down, if, if, if I'm in trouble, are all 65,000 going to have my back? Maybe not. The crowd is not company. And faces are but a gallery of pictures and talk but a tinkling symbol, you know, a la 1 Corinthians 13, where there is no love. True friendship is for us as human beings a necessity without which the world is but a wilderness. You're in the wild, you know, subject to anything if you don't have a true friend who has your back. Okay? All right, now. Uh, remember, also, in addition to uh, philia, we've been highlighting, of course, we talked about storge. Um, we've talked about other love words in the Greek language, but the two we're really highlighting that the New Testament strongly highlights are philia and agape. This is unconditional, selfless, godly love as it is developed in the New Testament. wasn't so much developed in classical Greek like that. It's, it's not at the high level that it is in the New Testament. But in the New Testament, it's claimed as the godly kind of chesed in the Old Testament. It's chesed, you know, steadfast love, love that will not let you go, that will give itself for you. True, unconditional, selfless, godly love, charity in the Old English, uh, you know, from Caritas. And then um, what Lewis calls gift love. It's not need love. It's not a transaction. I love you and I'm going to marry you because you make me feel good about myself. I mean, that's, even though that's supposedly high-level romantic love, that's actually a transactional love. I'll stay married to you as long as I feel good about myself when I'm with you. you know? I mean, <laughs> that's the way some people go into marriage, right? But, but this kind of love, agape love, is no matter what. No matter, e even if I'm not feeling good about myself when I'm with you, this, that, and the other thing, I will die for you. I'll lay down my life for you. So key action mindsets and issues with friendship. Talked about this last time. Here it is again. Number one, choosing. We have to choose, you know, either one of these high-level loves. This involves a lot of your agency, your morality, and your commitment. Okay, we've got to choose it. Number two, it involves mutual effort toward alignment. We may not agree on everything, but we need to come together in a meeting of the minds, heart, and soul. Okay? That's what that's talking about. And that's going to take a lot of effort because it's easy to have misunderstandings. We all know, of course, this applies in marriages. I've already introduced the concept of marriage here. So you know this, right? But this is also about true brotherly friendship. And then, third, there has to be trust. God calls us to trust him. This is a huge emphasis in the Bible, huge emphasis, to believe, to trust, to know he's true, he is the true one, and to no matter, even when we can't understand what's going on, to trust him. Well, in a friendship, there must be deep bonds and foundation of, of trust. Trust and belief, okay? Those are two big words in the, in the, in the Bible. In, in Hebrew, you have batach, which means to trust, and then you have aman, which means to believe. And you know that aman because what do we say at the end of a lot of things? Amen, right? That means it's true. I believe it. Do you hear what I'm saying? Okay, so in other words, you've got this trust and you've got this, yeah, it's true. I believe it, okay? Now, uh, let's keep going. We talked last week, and I we could pretty significant study last week on the fact that Abraham is God's beloved, God's friend, okay? Uh, I've got it in the handout here. Just remember that James refers to the fact that 
looking all the way back to Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, when it says that Ab Abraham or Abram believed, believed what God was saying to him, and God credited it to him, counted it to him as righteousness. That is the total prophetic line that runs all the way through the New Testament on justification by faith. But related to that, interestingly enough, James, referring to Genesis 15, 6, then goes on and says this, um, and he was called, Abraham, was called friend of God. Now, when you actually look in the Old Testament, the term that's typically translated as friend means beloved. You know, God loved Abraham. So that's, you see that in um, 2 Chronicles, as well as in Isaiah, Isaiah famously. You know, Isaiah um, chapter, eight, uh, chapter 41, verse 8, But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my beloved, Ohavi, my beloved friend. So in other words, God chose the Israelites because God loved his friend, Abraham. And they come from Abraham, and God made covenant with Abraham. That's what that's saying. Okay? Now, uh, we in Christ, as we talked about last week too, are children of Abraham. When we believe in Jesus, the Bible says we're children of Abraham. And whom do we know that God loves? We know he loves Abraham, his friend, right? And whom, whom does God ultimately, supremely love? His son, Jesus. So if we believe in Jesus, man, we just have this combination of love from God going on, and it's not about me. It's not about what I do. God has already loved Abraham, and obviously from before eternity, God loves his son. And if I believe in his son and am united um, from a human standpoint as a child of Abraham and a faith standpoint, a child of Abraham, and I am clothed in Christ, in his righteousness, we're looking pretty good. That's good news, isn't it? So that's real love, and that's saving love. Now, uh, we finally, last week, we talked about the fact that as children of Abraham, because we're believers in Jesus, and because as believers in Jesus, we're called to follow the way of Jesus, which includes brotherly love and faithfulness, right? We are then to do all these one another's for each other. And I mentioned last week, and I, I could have just done a whole night of one another's tonight. You know, there, there are, you know, multiple scores of these in the New Testament. I only gave us a few. That's what I'm going to stick with tonight as well. Um, we'll come back to this one tonight because it's going to key into where we're really going. A new commandment, Jesus says, I give to you. This is John 13, verse 34. That you love one another just as I have loved you you also are to love one another. We're called in the Christian faith to love one another. At what level? At Judas's level, I'm going to talk about him on Sunday. Judas, you know, he loved Jesus for a while. Is that, is, hey, I can do that. No, no, no. Is it Judas level? Is it Simon Peter level? What, what level? Jesus says, as I have loved you, so also you are to love one another. So what does Jesus do? He washes his disciples' feet. He puts up with their stupidity, their, you know, um, misunderstandings, all that type of thing, and ultimately he dies to take away their sin. And Jesus says, in the same way, you need to love one another. So we're supposed to be the friend who forgives, <laughs> right, uh, through Jesus. So that takes us to um, these other passages. But encourage one another every day, this is Hebrews 3.13, as long as it's still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We're supposed to encourage one another. You can think about, write some notes down. What are some ways we can encourage one another? Ignore each other and not talk to each other? Is that a good way to encourage one another? How can we encourage one another? talk with each other, pray for each other, say, it's, you know, you're going to make it. I, I see gifts in you. 
God is at work in your life, right? Don't, you know, don't tell stories, but I mean, seriously, encourage one another. Uh, in, I didn't see you at, you know, church Sunday. We need to have you back. We need you, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, encourage one another. I'm praying for you. I know you're going through a hard time. I'm praying for your wife. I'm praying for your son. I'm praying for your friend. And lots of encouragement. Encouraging one another to be, you know, as Hebrews is talking about, not to fall away from regular fellowship and worship together. All those kind of things are encouragement. Now, also, uh, Paul in Romans 12, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. And then, um, of course, back to the forgiveness and, and everything that goes with it. Colossians 3, um, put on then as God's chosen one, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. Do you see that? Bearing with one another. That's not talking about an animal. That means kind of being patient with one another, hanging in there with one another, okay? Yes, and definitely couples need to bear with one another, okay? Bear with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. At what level? The Simon Peter level? No. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must. Do you see that? Must. Do you see that language there? So you must forgive. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, as Jesus teaches us to pray. Well, there it is right there. Okay. Now, tonight, moving on. The friend of Caesar versus friends of Jesus. And we all get to make a choice here, right? You can be friends of Caesar, friends of Putin, I don't know, <laughs> Prigozhin, <laughs> friends of Prigozhin, or are you going to be friends with Jesus? Okay, so um, you see this inscription about of the friends of Caesars, what's that saying? Uh, Philo Kaiser Rome, okay, do you see that? It's on some coins from the time of, you know, the Roman Empire, Jesus. It's on... Um, columns and other things in theaters and public facilities because if you wanted to be a real success in the Roman Empire world it made sense to be part of the group that contributed towards you know projects and where you got the little emblem that said I'm a friend of Caesar right do you think that's the level that the Bible is talking about? No. <laughs> that's really transactional and really political, okay? Um, you know, you probably get fundraising letters. Dear close friend Martin, we're in this serious campaign and we just need your help over the next week so we can reach these certain giving levels. Have y'all ever gotten that? Where I'm really the good friend of this person who's running for this office. Okay. Does, is, that, is that a Jesus type thing? No, probably not, right? Okay, that's a transactional political kind of thing. Now, uh, that's certainly what was going on with this you know, designation of friends of Caesar at the time of the Roman Empire, when Jesus is ministering, okay? And when Paul and uh, the rest of the apostles are ministering. Now let's look at this interesting quotation. I certainly wouldn't have been, you know, looking at this quotation except we're doing this study. So here it is. I'm throwing it out for you. Um, the, the Jewish leaders come to Pilate, and Pilate, you may remember this, John makes this very clear, really wants to release Jesus. Y'all remember that? He really doesn't want to get cornered into, you know, having to have Jesus put to death. So notice this from John 19, verse 12. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. That's Jesus. But the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not. Do you see that? You are not Caesar's friend. Ukphilos to 
Casaros. You know, and if you're not Caesar's friend, your time on earth may be short. Purgosian's time on, I don't know, but you know, you just kind of don't want to mess with Caesar, okay? So they really, they're really wrapping, you know, Pilate around on this one. Everyone who makes himself a king, and that's what they say Jesus is making himself, opposes Caesar, literally speaks against Caesar. This guy's spoken against Caesar, and you're going to let him go? You're no friend to Caesar. I can't wait till we get the news back to Caesar. What do you think about this, Pilate? So they are cornering Pilate. Do you all see that? With this friend of Caesar language thing. Okay, now, uh, let's go back. I'm going to go back to a passage that we've been looking at the last couple Sundays. And Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and, uh, and those in authority are called benefactors. This is all part of this friendship patronage network in the Roman world, in the ancient world. There's all this transactional friendship and support going on. Okay? And people have a hierarchy with it. But Jesus goes on and says, But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become the youngest, and the leader is one who serves. For who is greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But look, I am among you as the one who serves. So Jesus is teaching that in his kingdom it's different than all this patronage and hierarchy stuff and all this bogus friendship stuff, you know, political stuff, economic stuff. Okay, he's... You are those who have stayed with me in my trials. And think back to the Proverbs. What is Jesus saying to them? You're my friends. Do you hear that? I mean, you've stood by me. You've stuck with me for over two years with all the opposition and the conspiracies arising around me and the crowds liking me for a while and then not liking me because of what I teach. They like my miracles, but they don't like my teaching. You've stuck with me. And I bestow to you as my father bestowed to me a kingdom. Why? So that you may eat and drink at my table. In other words, you're going to be my inner friendship group, okay? I hang out with you. And you may sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel because ultimately, even though it doesn't look like it right now, the ones who are truly my friends will be ascendant forever. The ones who are playing the games of the world are not going to end up well. That's what he just said. Now, let's go on and look at this. Luke, I'm, you know, in Luke, these are kind of build-up passages for the main passage we're going to look at. Uh, Luke 12, 1 through 5. In the meantime, when so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were trampling one another, this is one in Jesus' popularity phase now. We've got a popularity phase going on here. He began to say to his disciples first, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. I tell you, do you see that? My friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him, this is talking about God, runs all through the Old Testament. You'll have some people say, well, you know, you don't get the fear of God in the New Testament. Oh, yeah? Have you ever actually read the New Testament? Have you listened to Jesus? Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast you into hell. There's only one who has authority to cast you into hell. It's not the devil. The devil's going to be cast into hell. It's God, okay? So Jesus says, you're my friends, I want you to understand about how to live now and the way the judgment is going to go down. I know we've got all these crowds that think I'm great right now. That's not going to last. I want you, as my friends, to know what really lasts. And so he's warning them as his friends about the judgment. A true friend warns you, you need to get out of there. <laughs> that building is about to collapse, right? The false friend will say, that building looks lovely, honey. You know, um... Give me another drink, and I, I need to run right now, but uh, have, a, have a great night. A true friend tells you if the building is about to collapse and tells you which way you need to go. Jesus just did that. Okay, that's Luke. Now, uh, let's go over to John. Um, 
John 3, 29 and 30. This is John the Baptist, not to be confused with, you know, John the Apostle, the writer, okay? This is John the Baptist. John the Baptist says, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. Is John the Baptist the bridegroom? No. The bridegroom is the son of God, okay? So the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend, do you see that? The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. If I'm a friend of Jesus, whose glory am I totally focused on? My glory? That's the way a lot of human earthly friendships work, right? You scratch my back, I scratch yours, right? Or I like you as a friend because I'm kind of popular with other people when I hang out with you. No, 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 look at this. He must increase. I must decrease. Is that agape love? Yes. And it's very biblical and very prophetic from John, John the Baptist. Now, let's go on over to, uh, you need this verse because it, it comes back and connects with the John passage. A disciple is not above his teacher, uh, nor a servant above his master. So you see that in John 10, 24? A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. Jesus is saying, well, you know, you need to follow me in what I do. You're not better than I am. If I'm going to serve, if I'm going to give my life for God, you're called to do the same thing. Okay. Now, sorry, there's a typo here. That, that's John 10, verse 11. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, okay? The good shepherd, what does the good shepherd do? Lays down his life for his sheep. Now, the reason I'm putting that in there, I really want to highlight this for you. Jesus is going to be in, in various kinds of relationships with us, but he's calling us centrally to be his friends. But we're also his sheep. He'll lay down his life for his sheep. And if you're satisfied to just be a sheep, if, you know, if you've truly believed in Jesus you know, he'll save you. But if you live much longer than, uh, you know, that salvation calling, he's calling you to be more than a sheep. He's calling you to be a friend. You hear what I'm saying? But there, you got all these different levels of this. Okay, so that's, that's John chapter 10. You know, when Jesus is going through the I am statements, I am the door, um, I am the, you know, I'm, I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. Okay, now look, I'm the gate, I'm the door, and I'm also the good shepherd. That's the ultimate thing on that exchange of the I am's. Romans 5, 7 through 8. For one will scarcely die, this is the Apostle Paul talking, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one will even dare to die. But God shows his um, agapain, his sacrificial love, okay? Do y'all see that? He shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, and Paul has made it very clear that when we are sinners, we are enemies of God in rebellion against God. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4, 9 through 10. Now, what I'm, what, what I'm taking you to here is the fact that God and God's son, Jesus, take initiative not only to choose us, for a relationship in covenant with him, but also to sacrificially give themselves for us. So you have that in, in Paul in Romans 5, but it's not just Paul. Let's go over to 1 John 4, 9 through 10. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. How is it made manifest among us? That God sent his monogonese, his only son, into the world so that we might live through him. And now he's going to double down on this. In this is love, in case you didn't get the way God sent his son and what the mission was of the son. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's true love. That's the kind of love we're called to, that kind of love. Now, 
that sets us up to then dig into um, where we're heading in the, um, the Passover Eve discourse and the high priestly prayer that runs through chapters 13 through 17 of John's Gospel. Uh, I've pulled out a few highlights for us to look at contextually, and uh, we'll, we're ultimately going to end up in um, several verses in John chapter 15. Okay, but but let's let's get set up for this. I've already introduced some of this, but let's keep going. Remember, in chapter 13, at the beginning of this uh, Passover Eve discourse, Jesus is in the upper room. Okay? He's in the upper room for chapters 13 and 14, and then he moves. He's on the move through Jerusalem. Okay? I'll, I'll explain that when we go, go through this. Uh, look at the opening verse, chapter 13, verse 1. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved... Do you all see that? And that's, um, that's in the aorist, okay? So that's, it's, it's happened, okay? Um, Agapesos, his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now to the end, the way the ESV translates it, he, he uh, loved them to the very end. But in fact, in the, in the order, and I think the order is there on purpose, it says to the end. He, Jesus, loved them to the telos. And the telos, you know, is multivalent. It means not only to the end of his ministry, but it also means toward the ultimate end, the eschaton, probably. I, I would read it that way, both ways, okay? To the end, he loved them, his, his disciples, okay? 13.5. Um, I'm not going to go through all the, you know, the, the washing of the feet, but I did go ahead and pull a verse, so you've got this. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. It, the, and John tells us, because he knows that the Father is with him, this is all part of the plan. Um, he's assured in this, Jesus is, therefore, you know, he takes off his outer garment and he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him as a slave. Jesus is acting as a slave in this. You know, there's all these different images going on here. This is what a slave does. This is what Jesus is doing. Now, uh, verse 16 of chapter 13. Amen, amen. Right? Truly, truly. In other words, you can totally believe this. You better totally believe this, right? Um, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Remember when we saw that in Matthew chapter 10? Here it is again. Jesus, this is one of Jesus' saying that he repeats a lot. Now here he's talking about as the Lord with his servants or slaves. Because he, he owns them. I mean, they belong to him. You, you remember that, that Paul says, if you actually believe in Jesus because he paid the price for, you know, for you to be delivered, you owe your life to him. You're his slave, right? You're his bondservant, okay? Um, so, um, a man, a man, I say to you, a servant is not greater, a bondservant is not greater than his, his master or his Lord, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now, uh, now we go to a different imagery uh, at the close of this chapter. Little children, the term there is technia, okay? So, it means like child who's not anywhere close to being of age, okay? Little, little kid. So, so... Uh, ESV like elaborates that and says little children uh, yet a little while I am with you you will seek me and just as I said to the Jews so now I also say to you where I'm going you cannot come and by the way that verse is the prompter for John chapter 14 you know you know don't let your hearts be troubled trust in God trust also in me you know where I'm going and you know we don't know where you're going how can we know the way but look at this verse 34 a new commandment I give to you that you love, and this is subjunctive, this is something they're going to need to do, okay, but it's subjunctive, okay, um, one another, that you love one another, just as I have decisively loved you, you also are to, again, subjunctive, love one another. Now, uh, fast forward through uh, chapter 14, that's the, you know, 
Don't let your hearts be troubled, trust in God. It keeps going, okay? At the end of that, we've got a physical location teaching transition. Uh, Jesus says, I will no longer talk much to you for the ruler of this world is coming. Who's the ruler of this world? Satan, okay? He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. Now he's talking about his love for his Father. And if you're a friend of Jesus, you totally support and bow down to Jesus' commitment to his Father, okay? Uh, rise, let us go from here. So they're leaving the upper room. Now notice this. They've left the upper room. You know, my, I, I go with the interpretation that it's highly likely that Jesus is cutting through, you know, the temple area. And remember all the golden vines that are on the outer temple area, you know, that all these people contribute money to the golden vines. Jesus says, I'm the true vine. Okay? Not that gold stuff up there. Okay? That seems to be what he's saying. Uh, I am the true vine. My father's the vine dresser. You all remember this. Um, Whoever remains in me, Mineo, uh, whoever remains in me abides in me and I in him. He, he is it that bear, bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Now, uh, that's, that's one through eight. That's the, the, the true vine and the branches. We're the branches. We've got to remain in him if we're going to bear fruit. Nine through 12, continuing emphasis on an elaboration of the love of the Father for the Son and the, the Son for the Father and of the apostles called to be in this love relationship with Jesus. And then he repeats this, you know, with um, verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. In case you missed it, back in the upper room, now, now while we're walking through Jerusalem, let me make this very clear. As we head out to the Garden of Gethsemane, I really want you to get this. Okay? So, that's what he says, and that then is our transition verse into where we're going tonight. So, 15, 13 through 20. Now, now you understand what's, what's going on here. So Jesus is on the move. He's teaching his disciples about friendship and about true discipleship. Jesus says this at verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Remember, this is the night before Jesus is crucified. Jesus has completed what he's doing in the upper room. He's on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And by the way, are these guys going to stick with him through thick and thin this night? No, not quite. Okay? You are my friends, my friends, if, Aeon, you got to catch that now, <laughs> Aeon, okay, if, you do what I command you. So this is this a total even peer friendship relationship? No, it is not. Some people read this as Jesus is leaning heavily towards the patronage kind of friendship that I talked about earlier in the Roman Empire. I think Jesus is very clearly, that's why I gave you some of these other verses, including the part from Luke. Jesus is very clearly not just saying I exceed Caesar, but no, 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 I'm reframing the conversation, but I'm conversant with the patronage thing, okay? But you're, you're, you belong to me in a different way than anybody thinks of in terms of Caesar. And when you call me Lord, I am your Lord, but it's a, I'm, I'm claiming that title, but I'm claiming it under the Old Testament primarily, not vis-a-vis -vis Caesar. Now, that's a, I, I, I'm just going to give you that. So, but this is a big conversation now. You are my friends if you do what I command you. We're his friends, but we are his followers too, okay? He's the Lord. He's not our good buddy friend in the way we talk about it, you know, in earthly terms. He is the son of God who is our friend, okay? It's a different kind of relationship. So he says, you are my friends if you do what I command, uh, what I command you. Remember, he said, you love me if you do what I command, you know, and if you do what I command, you're going to bear much fruit. Now he's saying you're my friend, same kind of terms, if you do what I command. No longer do I call you, and here the term is doulos, and that can be translated, that's why I'm giving you these three versions here, slave, bondservant, or servant. ESV just translates it servant, but I want to make sure you know 
he's using a heavy term here. No longer do I call you slaves, bondservants, servants, because the slave, bondservants, servants, um, th that would be, uh, yeah, d uh, do not, excuse me, do not know uh, what, or excuse me, that, that's singular there, sorry, that's singular, that should be singular there. Because the slave, bondservant, servant, does not know what his master, the term there is kyrios. It's the same term we translate all through the New Testament as Lord. You know, Jesus Christ is Lord. Okay, here it probably means master, but it means master in a, like a high level, okay? Does not know what his master or Lord is doing. But I have called you, literally I've spoken of you, as friends. Because all things that I have heard from my father I've made known to you. So what Jesus just said is a slave or a low-level servant doesn't really know what the game plan is. But I'm sharing the game plan with you. Now, we don't get the whole game plan. He's going to make that clear later. Like, they don't understand everything that's going on. It's going to be, have to be revealed to them by the Spirit after the resurrection. But he's given them the basic game plan. He's told them repeatedly he's, he's going to die for them. He's told them this night he's going to die for them and that he must die for them for them to be saved. He's told them all that. He hasn't hidden it from them. So he says, look, I'm treating you like friends, like my inner circle. So therefore, I'm expecting you because I'm giving you that kind of relationship with me and I'm sharing the plan with you. You be faithful to the plan. You do what I'm teaching you to do. That's, that's what he's saying, okay? So if we're gonna be friends with Jesus, we need to follow the Lord's plan and be faithful and obedient to his commands. Um, because all things that I've heard from my Father I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. The key thing again there, love one another. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. So listen to this. If we're really friends with Jesus, if we're really being faithful to Jesus, what Jesus is saying here, and you hear this repeatedly from Jesus in the New Testament, people are not going to like you. There's going to be people who are hostile to you. And if you say, I, I don't have anybody that is bothered by my Christian faith, I'd say, you apparently aren't being a really faithful friend to Jesus. Because according to Jesus, because there's hostility to him, anybody who's really tight with Jesus, people are going to oppose. It's guaranteed. And he's saying it right here in the friendship discussion. Everybody sees that, right? Does anybody have any question on that? It's very apparent. And if you say nobody has any problem with my Christian faith, I'm saying, are you really being a friend? Are you really standing for Jesus in the midst of the world? Um, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Uh, that, that is not sugar-coated. That is flat-out obvious, okay? Then he says, remember the word that I said to you. There it is again, right? I've shown you it in Matthew. I've shown you it in John chapter 13 earlier that night in the upper room. So here it is. Jesus says it again. Remember the word I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master or his Lord. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. In other words, the people who follow me and obey my word, they're also going to be, you know, consistent with you. And if you're in a position of authority, like these apostles, they're going to obey you. But the people who hate me and don't obey me, they're going to hate you too. It's the, the lines are clearly drawn here. And Jesus says that's what it means to be friends with him. So that's... That's the deep part of this. Now, uh, let's kind of pull back and go over some things we've talked about several times. Number one, notice that God, and specifically Jesus, as God's son who's come to earth, takes initiative to reach out to us to draw us into friendship. So what is one of the things about being a true Christian is we take initiative to draw other people into a friendship relationship in the faith, okay? That's the Jesus model. Um, 
the Jesus model for friendship is sacrificial love. Not what can you do for me, but much more what can I do for you. Okay, that's the Jesus model of friendship and friendship love. If we're followers of Jesus, these are going to be markers of the way we relate to people. Okay? Uh, if we're followers of Jesus, um, we, we persevere through our friends' failures. We encourage them and we forgive them. If we're following Jesus, that is the model. That's the way we're friends with them. Okay? Um, if we're friends with Jesus, we center our friendship around our best friend, who's not, by the way, our best buddy. He's our Lord friend, and his name is Jesus. So the people who are closest to us will also be close to Jesus, or we'll be in the process of helping draw them close to Jesus. But remember what we talked about the first night, what Paul says, you know, Christians are not supposed to be equally yoked with unbelievers. You should not be in tight friendships. You can be friends, you know, friendly with people who are not believers, but you're calling them to Jesus. Um, now you, you can engage with them in, you know, friendship acts. Because, by the way, it should not be just a transaction like, well, I'm, I'm kind of acting like your friend because I want you to believe in Jesus. Don't do that. I mean, it should be, you know, truly spirit-led and organic, uh, natural, um, or supernatural, you might say. But um, it shouldn't be a transaction thing, this friendship with anybody. Because remember, the Caesar friendship model is transactional. What will it get me and how does it kind of arrange me in the hierarchy of power and success? That is not Jesus' friendship model. Jesus' friendship model is not utilitarian in any way, shape, or form the way the world teaches you. It's a different kind of friendship. So... It's a beautiful model. Um, all you have to do is look at Jesus. If I'm going to be a Christian and a Christian friend, look at his friendship. Look at his sacrificial love. Look at his initiative in choosing and reaching out to people. Look at his initiative and his perseverance in the failure of his closest you know, companions. And look at the way he serves. He serves. I mean, he's, he's the Lord. He, he repeatedly makes this clear. He's the Lord, but he's also the one who serves his friends. So those are the models, points of reference with Jesus and friendship. It's inspiring, isn't it? Powerful. Um, and also, of course, pretty deep. As, as I mentioned already, I just thought this was kind of interesting looking at this friend of Caesar, friend of Jesus, you know, contrast that's there clearly in the gospel. I never actually really looked at that before, uh, but I got into, I, I in part got into that because of the, uh, there's a, a biblical scholarship dispute on, you know, how much Jesus is leaning on the patronage model. And then I was looking at the, um, the John passage about the Jewish leaders cornering Pilate by saying you're not a friend of Caesar and it's I think the, the gospels are clearly calling us to understand this difference uh, most of the friendships of even this very day in the 21st century are in that you know Roman model not the Jesus model let's be different but I can tell you this you will not always be understood and people will not always be good to you when you're a friend of them. But as Jesus says, you know, the servant or that junior friend, which is what we are, is not above the master. And those who would be bad to Jesus will probably also be bad to us, but they're going to be ones who believe Jesus and become our true brothers in the faith, sisters in the faith. So go with that, and let's turn to the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we rejoice in who you are as God's one and only Son, as our Redeemer. And Lord, we know you're the Lord, but also as our friend. 
And Father, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would empower us to obey the words of Jesus, to follow Jesus, to glorify you, to glorify his name also, and to be true friends of the bridegroom who always say in every decision we make here in this life you give us, he must increase. It's all about him. It's all about Jesus. I want to serve him, including even when I'm dealing with troubling and troublesome people, even hostile people. Let me be, by your spirit, more and more like Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.